Good evening again and I just wanted to share with you a little bit about my background and how I escaped from a kind of fundamentalist Christianity which I became, which I entered into initially. Uh, for a brief period before I left Christianity I was a, I was a Catholic but for most of the time I was a conservative evangelical of a fundamentalist kind and one of the books that really helped me to break free of that was a book called Escaping from Fundamentalism um, by a chap called James Barr, who is a professor of um, theology at Oxford University, a professor of Hebrew uh, as well, um, an Old Testament scholar. And this little book, um, he was a really trenchant critic of evangelical fundamentalism. And he, with, with forensic laser-like precision, he really um, deconstructed it, analysed it and exposed it for the emptiness intellectually that it is. Um, which is why I'm quite scathing of um, fundamentalist apologists. I won't mention their names, but you know, having been one myself and been through the pain of leaving it, like a reformed ex-smoker, I'm quite uh, anti-smoking or anti-fundamentalist because I know what damage it does to the to the soul and to the intellect. Um, but I want to share with you a rather, for me, rather juicy passage in here. Um, the chapter is called "Is the Bible Theologically Perfect?" and um, he writes in a particular, slightly old-fashioned way, but I'll, I'll read it and explain it um, as I go along. But he quotes some two Bible passages, and he shows how evangelical fundamentalists, um, when they um, interpret the Bible, it's all about how they read the Bible, they'll take some things very literally and really focus on them, and they'll take other passages, passages, uh, and it um, which are just equally uh, uh, the same kind of teaching or different kinds of teaching, but they'll see them as very symbolic and really put them in second place. And, and the way they create this hierarchy within the Bible, which is not required by the Bible itself, tells us a lot about the ideology of fundamentalism and, uh, and what it tries to do. So he writes on page 112, the various forms of Christianity, so he's talking about uh, all of the various forms, evangelicalism, Catholicism, Anglicanism, liberalism, they are traditions in which different selections and arrangements within the Bible are customary. It may be sometimes that in evangelical fundamentalism this is not so, and that fundamentalism fully accepts everything that's in the Bible. It gives everything its fullest value as being totally accurate and fully inspired by God. And this is what evangelicals will always tell you, of course. Boasts like the full gospel imply this position. But it's easy to see that fundamentalism, in spite of its strong insistence, everything in the Bible is verbally inspired and totally accurate, is in its actual preaching and teaching a highly traditional mode in which biblical materials are ranked and ordered. Those that are ranked lower are interpreted in the light of those that are ranked higher. Some are taken literally, and in these cases, the literalness of interpretation may be highly emphasised. But others are taken figuratively and thus have a different kind of truth attached to them. Compare, for example, these two different answers to the question, how one may be saved. So this is a really fundamental question for Christians. How are we saved? And he now quotes two passages in the New Testament which both answer this question. And notice how different they are. The first one is this. Does the jailer in Philippi said, and this is quoting from the book of Acts chapter 16, men, what must I do to be saved? And they said, as Paul and the others, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. End quote. That's Acts 16, verse 30 onwards. Very clear. What must I do to be saved? Believe in the Lord Jesus. And Christians or evangelicals will tell you this all the time. Very clear, isn't it? Except we have another answer to the same question. What must we do to be saved? This time from the teaching of Jesus. A man ran up and knelt before Jesus and asked him, good teacher, what must I do to, to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? There is no one good but God alone. You know the commandments. Don't kill, do not commit adultery, don't steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honour your father and mother. And he said to him, Teacher, all these I have observed since my youth. And Jesus, looking upon him, loved him and said, 
you lack one thing. Go sell what you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. And come follow me. It's Mark chapter 10, verse 17 onwards. And James Barr very uh, perceptively comments. Now, in the fundamentalist tradition, the Acts passage, the first answer, gives exactly the right answer. What Paul and Silas there say is precisely what the evangelical preacher says. Only this one thing counts, that you should believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. But the passage in Mark is on a quite different footing. Few in that tradition of Christianity, that's evangelicalism, will be asked if they have kept the t- fewer in a fundamentalist society are likely to be told that they may inherit eternal life through selling their goods and giving to the poor. Although this is the very teaching of Jesus himself, one will commonly find that it is effectively downgraded and made figurative and subordinated to the type of answer that the Acts passage gives. By the way, I have seen this all the time. This is absolutely standard, always happens. The goods, it may be said, that the young man possesses uh, are not actual goods or money that he has to give to the poor, but rather his worldly basis of security, his knowledge, his morality, his attendance at church. It is these rather than actual possessions or money that he has to get rid of. Put at its crudest, this interpretation says, sell what you have and give to the poor, which means make a decision for Christ and become an evangelical. This is a very drastic reinterpretation of Jesus' words. But the need for so drastic a change in their meaning should not surprise us too much. For what Jesus says, taken for itself, would seem to imply that eternal life may be ensured through the keeping of the commandments, plus the giving away of one's property, a teaching that might well seem to many to be a complete contradiction to the idea of justification by faith. So I think this is, and this book uh, is full of insights into all sorts of evangelical doctrine. Virtually all evangelical doctrine and belief is, is not found, to put it mildly, in the teaching of Jesus, in, in as far as we see it in the earliest Gospels. And I'm not saying the teaching of Jesus in the Gospels is perfectly preserved. It's not. It's refracted through a later Christian understanding. But we do, I think, have a lot of historic, historically reliable material, particularly in Mark and Q, um, our two earliest sources that we still have. And the Gospel message there is quite different from the gospel message of Paul and evangelicals and and even the Catholic Church today. And we see this in the two examples that James Barr mentions. In Acts, it says men, uh, the the jailer in Caesar Philippi, the city of Philippi, the jailer says to Paul and Silas, what must I do to be saved? And they say, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And that is the classic evangelical answer. And then we go to Mark's gospel, um, which purports to be the teaching of Jesus um, during his ministry. What must I do to be saved? Obey the commandments. And in this one individual's case, that he lacks one thing. The one thing he lacks to get eternal life is to give all his wealth to the death and resurrection uh, or be a born again Christian or be an evangelical or anything like that. Um, so these are quite different answers, but Barr's point is that the first answer, the Acts answer, is the uh, is the normative answer, and any other answer from the Gospels is drastically reinterpreted, basically completely distorted to somehow fit in with the correct evangelical answer. And this is how evangelicals interpret the Bible. So they like to harmonise using the most extraordinary uh, intellectual gymnastics um, to create an artificially harmonious scripture, when in fact it's a library of books often teaching very different and contradictory things on the law, the Jewish law, on who Jesus is, on the means of salvation, and, and so on and so forth. There, there's some books in the Bible that say there is there is no afterlife. Once you're dead, you're dead. Ecclesiasticus, for example. So that there are these, these quite strong differences of um, opinion on all sorts of subjects. So I just want to share that with you. And of course, Coming to terms with these realities for me was quite difficult. 
Um, it was quite a wrench to try and process this stuff. But I did in the end. And the lifeboat for me was Islam, which, of course, in comparison, doesn't have these contradictions and these uh, uh, problems at all. It's a very simple faith in one God, which, which we call Tawheed. Um, and it doesn't have contradictory answers to questions about what must I do to be saved and what pleases God. It's a very consistent and homogenous understanding of uh, the, our walk with God and, and how we achieve success in this life and in the hereafter. Anyway, I just wanted to share that with you.